so you can, you can see all of you. You, got, you have to smile though, okay? Make sure you smile. Hair. Yes. Anyone here local? Anyone from out of town? Me too. Brian? Brian Weiser? Where are you, Brian? Brian Weiser? Where? Hi, Brian. Your parents here? South Ballroom. <laughs> Captain Mel, Captain Hammer, and Nathan Philly. <laughs> this is my and Catherine. And this is my favorite part of the conventions because I get to talk to you <laughs> and share this intimate personal moment. <laughs> and find out what exactly your burning desire questions are. You there's something inside you you want to know. Something that maybe can't be Googled. <laughs> I love that when I get on Twitter. When's the new season of uh, Castle gonna start? I don't know. <laughs> I go to work and I do my thing and other people, that's not my job. <laughs> Google. <laughs> Some things can't be Googled. Salt Lake City and visitors. <laughs> Some things you need to get from the source. <laughs> or me. <laughs> so we got microphones. Uh, wait, what, do you want to start over here? Just some questions? Doctor Strange. <laughs> Nicely done. Um, Captain, I was wondering. Uh, <laughs> as someone who's teased about it a lot as a kid, um, have you ever played Dungeons and Dragons? And if say invited by, I don't know, Will Wheaton to play a board game with him, would you do it? Chris Pelche uh, was a friend of mine in seventh grade and he invited me over and his older brother uh, was the dungeon master and we were playing Dungeons and Dragons. It took so long. <laughs> when is something gonna happen? My favorite part of playing Dungeons and Dragons was uh, rolling the dice and figuring out my character and then drawing him. This is, this is my guy. That's that sword we were talking about. It's not bad. But I found the game itself to be a little drawn out. But my favorite part about playing the game was drawing things out. Anyway. Would I ever play a board game with Will Wheaton? My practice is... Never start playing a game you know you can't win. <laughs> and I don't care what you think when you look at Will Wheaton, but that kid's smart. <laughs> Take it from me. Thank you very much, my friend. Was there another one on this side? Is there another question? Uh, yes, um, you've clearly had a lot of experience working with Joss Whedon. Clearly. Um, I was wondering uh, what it was like working with him as opposed to other directors and any special things about working with Joss Whedon. First of all, uh, I don't care who you are, someone's gonna ask you a question and you go, oh, uh, yeah, I don't know, um, maybe uh, we can do it like this. Never Joss Whedon. Joss Whedon has it all planned out. <laughs> the lights, the time of day, the hair, the clothes, the music, the pace, the camera angle. Exactly. It's, he knows 
before it starts. Also, he has a very pleasant way of, and it's an art. Everybody has an idea. Joss has a very pleasant way of saying no when your idea sucks. I come up with a lot of ideas. 98% of which are terrible. Joss will say something along the lines of, yeah, or, and then say something brilliant, and you go, oh, yeah, yeah, that'd be good. Or he'll say, that's an amazing idea. No, nope, wait, the other thing. He has a way of, of um, when it's really necessary that he says no. He has a way of saying no that doesn't make you feel like an asshole. Is there anybody under the age of 18 here? 16, <laughs> sorry, a-hole or dummy. Let's say dummy. He has a way of not making you feel like a dummy. <laughs> Excellent question, both of you. Over here. Hi, my name is Seth, and I was curious, do you have waking nightmares, or you just try to ignore it, the role of the whiny little crybaby in Saving Private Ryan? <laughs> I just recently did a, a benefit, at the Geffen Theater in Los Angeles uh, did a benefit honoring a, uh, a fellow from Walt Disney, Al Horn, and Steve Martin. There was a lot of big, I didn't know, but there was a lot of big major Hollywood players in the audience. And they said, hey, would you come down? There's gonna be a bunch of actors and they're gonna just tell a story about backstage or behind the scenes. And I said, sure, sounds great. And I, I wrote this kind of, I wrote this story about my experience on Saving Private Ryan, which was my very first film. I was 25 years old. I had no idea what I was doing. I'd never been to London. I'd never been Europe to the UK. I'd never been across the ocean like that. It was a lot of firsts. I was very excited. And then, and then I met a man named Dale Dye. And this story I told was a horrifying story uh, where this, this, this fella, Dale, Dale Dye, was, joined the Marine Corps in 1964. He had 31 combat missions, two Bronze Stars, a Purple Heart. This guy is a hard ass. And now he's a military advisor for films, and he's the guy who put the cast of Saving Private Ryan. Did you ever hear that story? They went through basic training, and then one night they said, this blows, let's not do this anymore. And they said, let's take a vote. And the only person to vote to stay was Tom Hanks. And they all went, all right, we'll stay too. Dale Dye, I came out and I'm all dressed up in a World War II outfit. And everybody, all the background, they're all British military personnel, they're all dressed up in World War II outfits. Dale Dye comes strolling out and he starts setting his background. He goes, you, watch you over there by that building. You, over there by that dead horse. And he comes to me and he says, you, you see that pile of bricks way at the end of that road? I want you on the other side of those. I said, oh, because someone had just told me, hey, stay right here. Steven Spielberg will be right here and he'll tell you where he wants you to go. So I had my orders. So he says, yeah, I want you on the other side of those. And he turns around and says, I gotta stay here. And he stops. <laughs> He's dressed up in a World War II outfit too. And he outranks me. <laughs> Everybody who was there, all these guys I'd met that morning, and they're all nice fellas and really cool. They all go like this. <laughs> Except one guy's doing this. This guy got in my face. Maybe you don't understand. I say what to do, and you do it. Over there. All I had to do was say, oh, simple misunderstanding. I'm not background, I'm in the next scene. He told me to wait here with Steven Spielberg. And all I said was, I stand right here. Now he's so close, I can feel every word on my face. We're gonna try this one last time. 
And if you don't do what I say, here's what's going to happen. And all of a sudden, Steven Spielberg comes out and goes, Hey, Nathan, great, come on over here. This is what we want you to do, and this and that. And I look back, and there's Dale Dyer. I shit my pants. So that's the only nightmare I have. That was a long story. I'm so sorry. That was it. That was it. On Castle, they have a lot of veiled references to Firefly. That's true. That's true. I was wondering if that's something the writers just threw in or where that it was inspired from, because that's one of my favorite aspects of the show. If it is written into the show, chances are it was written by a writer into the show. If I'm dressed as Malcolm Reynolds, you know that's in the show. There was one bit where they hand us gloves. I don't know if you noticed this. Did anybody here watch Castle? That's right. Castle rarely um, touches anything, because I don't like putting on the gloves. And I discovered that early on, but one time I had to touch something, so they give me gloves, and they were blue. I put them on, I went. <laughs> Just a little. Another time, they, they wrote it in, uh, talk, uh, my mother, Susan Sullivan, wonderful lady, uh, said, you've never heard of the Serenity? She was talking about Serenity Spa. And camera's over here, and I did one of these. She's almost looking right in the barrel, but not quite, she's talking to the side. That stuff's me, but if it's written in, it's, it's written in, so it's a, it's a team effort. It's, which is, by the way, super duper cool because they're, they're so ready to acknowledge to the fans that we know you're out there and thank you. We had a soap opera episode and I had a line saying, I got my the story idea from my first book from watching Days of Our Lives. And I said to the writer, hey, if it's no difference to you, can I say one life to live? Because I was on that. <laughs> I was like, yeah, sure, man. I think they're all ABC anyway, right? <laughs> Thank you. Over here. I love your hair. Thank you. <laughs> um, my name is Megan, and I have two questions. Okay, Megan. Oh, a question and a request. The first of which is, how did you feel about the Netflix Firefly prank on April 1st? Okay, A, who didn't know that was coming? Come on. <laughs> B, thanks Netflix, because now I gotta listen to everybody on Twitter going, oh man, that was not cool. <laughs> right in the feels. <laughs> if you read, and if you read some of the comments under their article, not pleasant. <laughs> Nobody going, ha ha, you got me. No, it's like, Dialogue. <laughs> and what was the other one? The other one is, it's my sister Tana's birthday today and mine is tomorrow. Would you mind saying happy birthday to us? Happy birthday to us. <laughs> Hi. Hi, my name is Pam and I was wondering, um, I know you had to learn a lot of Mandarin for the Firefly and I was wondering if the swear words you use on a day-to-day -day basis still or ever. Um, I don't use them, uh, they, don't, they don't just pop out. Um, like, ooh, sorry, I spoke Mandarin. <laughs> um, but of all, all the Chinese we learned, uh, I only remember my first phrase I had to speak. For some reason it stuck. A Chinese affiliate came to Castle, and they were filming Seamus Dever, and they were trying to teach him how to say Merry Christmas in Chinese. I guess this was just before Chinese Christmas. <laughs> As they're 
actually filming him and he's practicing his Chinese, he's practicing his Chinese. I just walk in, I hear him speaking Chinese, I lean over his shoulder and I say, the only thing I know how to say in Chinese. Mei tamara tian jia soya dren de goisa. I check it out on YouTube later. <laughs> the entire thing is bleeped out. story is, oops. <laughs> My name is Debbie, and we all know how much you're admired and adored. Restraining orders aside, what is your craziest fan experience? Uh, first of all, first of all, never, ever endeavor to find out where a celebrity lives. To send a happy thank you note, not to send a fan script, and not to pop by. There is nothing you can say that doesn't say, I'm crazy, and I know where you live. Be cool. I'm not talking to you guys, obviously, I'm talking to everybody on the internet who's gonna watch us on YouTube. Be cool. Craziest fan experience. I was signing autographs at a table. It's kind of on a riser, a little lower than this. Signing autographs, people are going by. This one fan came by, a little exuberant. No biggie, I like that. Move on, they're down here, I'm signing up. Hey Nathan, hey Nathan, hey Nathan. I just finished signing, and I just, I'm not on to other people. I'm trying to get them attention, that's fair. I said, I'm sorry. I said, yes. Uh, you know that nude scene you did? <laughs> you should do more of those. <laughs> That's really creepy, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I love your outfit. I almost wore the same thing. But I thought it was a little on the nose. Special. Right Thank you, Nathan. Um, my name is Halo, and my question for you is, I've heard you talk in different interviews about um, having a bucket list and having things that you've done that, have you, that you've checked off your bucket list. So what I want to know is, what's now ahead for you um, on your bucket list? What's at the top, personally and professionally? I just kicked off one of the items on my bucket list last night. I had dinner with, um, save for one, the entire bridge. and or cigar. 
drop a match in gas. <laughs> well, the bad guy watches and goes, Walk away from an explosion. <laughs> and uh, next to defuse a bomb, I have check. Gina, 
ladies on Firefly started out gorgeous. They get more beautiful every time I see them. <laughs> Whilst every day I look in the mirror, I call it the daily betrayal. <laughs> uh, Adam Baldwin. I have fun at work. I enjoy my work. I enjoy my job. <laughs> well, when Adam's there, it's just fun and easy. It's just easy. Gosh, he's good. He works hard. That man is a hard-working man. And he makes it a joy to, to work with him. We've been trying to get Alan Tudyk on. And I've been pitching this storyline. Out there, somewhere, is another cop author team doing the same thing that Beckett and Castle are doing. Just kind of cheaper, because they're copying, right? <laughs> Alan's the author, and he's English, and he's pompous, and he's a dummy. <laughs> Until, you know, they get into trouble and bullets are flying, and it turns out, he's not English at all, he's from Wisconsin. That's the, that's the story I keep pitching. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hey, Captain Joanne. Hello, Joanne. So, I'm curious, of all of the things that you've done, what is the scene that you're the most proud of? The scene? Or character. The, the scene. scene, the scene. Uh, my, I, I've said it before, and this is not a tough one. My favorite job ever has been Firefly. That's just, that's just like... I'm glad you're happy about that, because sometimes Castle fans go, oh! <laughs> you always talk about Firefly like you love it so much. <laughs> to that, I'd like to respond. Let's say you really, really like strawberry ice cream. Who likes strawberry ice cream? I like chocolate. Now if I gave you six years of strawberry ice cream, you gonna be mad at me because I like chocolate? But if there's no chocolate, I'll eat strawberry. <laughs> um, my favorite scene. That's something I've never actually thought of before. I know, I know scenes that worked out really, really well. Um, Alan, Alan Tudyk and I did uh, War Stories that episode. <laughs> we had this entire scene of, of, of torture. We we're talking through torture. And, and Alan came to my house and after work, which was tough to do because we worked a lot. So this was on our own time. He came to my house and we worked out what it's going to be like to be electrocuted and what it's going to be like. How are you going to talk through it? And how do you, how do you put that aside to push through this? And how do you, we, we had to work a lot of stuff out. And the director was very kind to us, help, help make us out with that. We worked very, very hard on that. And it was a challenge that I've never experienced before. I've never had a conversation through electrocution on, on film. <laughs> to the following day, after we filmed that thing, we were on these stretchers, these kind of stretchers that, it's, it's an actual stretcher that they clip in underneath you. It's in two halves, they slip it underneath you. So these two panels, right at the back of your head, have a space between them. So while we're getting electrocuted, we're hitting our hands. Oh, two bruises right down the back of your head. Worth it. Alan Tudyk is <coughs> Juilliard trained. Alan, Alan Tudyk doesn't gush over work, people's work. If he says something about somebody's work, it's because it's amazing. Right now, he's really into Orphan Black. <laughs> he says this woman, her character work is phenomenal. Alan Tudyk himself will make three choices before he ever opens his mouth to see a line. That's acting. 
he works at it really hard. I go, oh, I just figured I'd be like, mad. <laughs> but Alan's always working and it's, it's never, fine is never good enough. He needs it to be good and it's always a pleasure to work with him. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My name is Colleen. Hi, Colleen. And my first two questions have already been snapped up, so do you have an interesting story about doing Dr. Horrible? Yes. <laughs> uh, so friends and I were talking the other day about uh, background artists. Not an easy job. Uh, not an easy job to do well. Uh, we have fantastic background artists on cast. Amazing guys. And ladies. Um, there was a background artist in the laundry room scene. Uh, laundry Day, I believe is the song. There's a shot where he's pulling open his laundry machine and we see the glass door and then someone else pulls open theirs and someone else pulls open theirs. And it goes down the line and everybody's throwing their laundry. In. This kid whips open the door and he's mouthing the words to the song. Josh goes, hold up, hold up. Just don't, just don't, uh, don't uh, mouth the words of the song. Just, just a little bit longer. He goes, no, 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 I need to mouth the words. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm pretty sure no. <laughs> he was adamant. No, don't you get it? Because I'm the guy who's like the next guy who's, so I'm gonna have to mouth, I have to. <laughs> Here's what you don't wanna do. As a background artist, tell the director what has to happen. <laughs> it was a little awkward for all of us. But Joss was very patient and very kind. He said, I, I've thought about this pretty hard. I, I'm gonna go with, you just don't. And, and no one else is, so it would be weird if, if you were the only one who did. So let's just go with no. He was convinced, eventually. But it was odd. It was odd. Any uh, aspiring actors in the crowd? <laughs> Learn from his mistakes. <laughs> I once called cut during Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> All I had to do was cry. I wasn't crying. I was like, I can't. I, can, I, can, I can, cut. This is ridiculous. I can't. Steven Spielberg says, No, don't worry about it. Listen, we're so far away. It's just a wide shot. Don't worry. We're just establishing where everybody is. It's not a big, we're not into the face, so don't worry about that. And I'll, I'm the director, so I'll yell. Cut. Yes, sir. That makes a lot of sense. No, I think I should yell. Hi, I'm Amy. Hi, Amy. Your whole family loves everything you've done. We Your love whole family? All. Yes, our whole family. Your whole family has excellent taste. Yes, they do. And we exceptionally love our sitting down and watching Castle every week. And we Thank were you. so excited when they came out with the book Heat Wave for yes, people to buy. Yes. And what would mean the world to us if Richard Castle signed it. But that's not my question. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, it is, but it's not. Okay. <laughs> we wanted to know if you had any input or involvement with the books. No. <laughs> there is an episode of Castle uh, in season two when the book is being released. I don't know, there's a release party. Uh, my agent is there, we're having a great time. She comes over to me and she goes, Hey, sorry, I gotta pull him away. He takes me away from the table where I'm sitting there talking to a classy looking gentleman. I wanna say he had a goatee so long ago, four years, five years ago. And uh, that guy is the guy who writes the Richard Castle novels. He said to me, I've never, I've written a lot of books, Nathan. I've never written a book that landed on the New York Times bestseller list. And now that I have, it's your picture on it. <laughs> to which I said, right? Hello, Captain. I'm yeah. a doctor. Thank you, doctor. Doctor. <laughs> uh, 
actually, I was just wondering, um, because I, I started watching Firefly a few years ago and, uh, and everything, thought you were great and all, but I saw a picture on Facebook, not too recently, of you and Matt Smith in a Delor like next to Gloria or something like that, and uh, I was thinking, I was wondering, what's your take on Doctor Who? I got, I got a lot of catching up to do with Doctor Who, I'll confess. But growing up in Canada, uh, TV really sucked. <laughs> Especially if you didn't have cable. We had four channels, one of which was French. <laughs> so, but the French, they were a little, uh, they were a little more loosey-goosey with their censorship. Sometimes you could see a boob. <laughs> so it was always worth checking out. But one of our many few options was Doctor Who. The classic, the old one, the big long scarf and the giant nose and the afro. Something oddly repelling, yet compelling about that man. And it was the only access we had to uh, sci-fi night night, because it was on every night. So, my Doctor Who experience is childhood memories of certain scenes and his accent and the terrible special effects. <laughs> and Matt Smith at a DeLorean. <laughs> That's my Doctor Who experience, really. Also, Matt Smith, great with animals. <laughs> Sir, I like your shirt. Thank you. Uh, so my name's Steven, and I'm an aspiring animator. I'm currently studying animation at Utah Valley University. That's it. Thank you. And um, pursuing one career often means closing the door on another, and so uh, that means closing the door on an acting career. Um, so I have a very uh, some, somewhat outlandish request. If I said, explode, I don't want to explode, would you be able to pick up the scene to when you say, no grenades. No grenades. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Spoiler. So, <laughs> I think it'd be so awesome to work with you someday as an animator. You're right about that. <laughs> or an actor. And that might not happen, which is, so my request is, if I played the part of Jane just standing here, yeah. and you picked up your part as Captain yeah. Malcolm Reynolds, yeah. and that scene where in the very begin the beginning of Serenity, when you're walking down, do you remember all those lines, or...? Let me, see, let me see how well I do. All right. I said no grenades. Oh. Oh. Is that it? No. Huh. I failed. Um, in fairness, when was, see, when was the last time you saw Serenity? Uh, this week. <laughs> yeah. It's my favorite movie. Yeah. Mine too, <laughs> but um, to be honest, when I think about the scene you're thinking about, I think about different things. I think about the fact that it took all day to shoot that top half. It's all one shot. When we go down the stairs and we swing the camera back and catch the doctor and he goes down the stairs, during that swing, cuts to the next day where he went next door to the bottom half of the ship. It was on a different stage. They had the bridge and the kitchen on gimbals. The whole thing would shake. So on this TV series, we would all just shake. Oh my God, and he shake the camera. In the movie, <laughs> everything shook. All you had to do was stay on your feet. That's your job. So I think of a lot of different things. I don't think of the lines, I think, as much, but it's still, uh, it's really important to me. Can I tell you a story? Yeah. Let me tell you a quick story. We had the episode where we were uh, eating steaks at the end of the show. We delivered all those cows. Everything's happy. We finished the dinner scene just as we were approaching lunch. And I had learned in the pilot, because I punctuated a line by eating a big piece of tomato. I took a big chunk of tomato, because tomatoes were a big thing. You don't get a lot of tomatoes. And Book brought tomatoes. 
if you take a big bite of tomato every time at the end of the scene, that equals a lot of tomatoes. <laughs> so while we were filming the steak scene, I learned my lesson. I fake eat, I cut, I put something on my fork, I go, well, here's the deal about that. <laughs> and then the next time you cut to me, <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> but you never eat. That way you don't get stuffed, that way you're like, oh my God. But when they cut for lunch, 10, is that my score? That's how, that's how long we have left. That's all, we have 10 minutes left. I'm not sure about this story. When they called and said, that's lunch, everybody. Adam Baldwin and I were sitting at the table and everybody left and we were looking at each other going, these are two really good, hot steaks. <laughs> so we sat there. <laughs> and it's goofy, it's goofy, I know it is. I'm not a shishi foo foo actor, but sometimes I would walk through the ship in my outfit and I would just kind of if it was closed off, it was better, but if there's an open wall for cameras to come in, I would just turn my back to that open wall and I would just look at the interior of the ship, and for moments, I would feel like, I just put myself in the mind frame, this is home, this is home. And, I, and for moments, fleeting moments, it would feel like home. There I am in costume, the captain and Jay eating steaks, <laughs> on mismatched plates, mismatched forks and knives at that old crappy table in our kitchen. And for a moment, it felt like home. It was a good moment. You ever get that feeling, Steve? Yeah, I do. Good, me too. Hi, my name is Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Hi. Um, I work do they as tell you to introduce yourselves as you come up? Do they tell you, or are you just all so wonderfully polite? We just really want you to know. I love name. you guys. That's amazing. <laughs> down in Las Vegas for the show at the Wynn Hotel. Um, What's the show? What's the show? It's called La Rev. Okay. Awesome show. Okay. Um, and so I'm curious to know if you ever have had a favorite costume and if you've ever had any entertaining wardrobe or prop malfunctions. <laughs> Captain Malcolm Reynolds' pants came up to here like Charles Ingle. Everybody who just laughed, I know how old you are. <laughs> they were some kind of, we borrowed them from something. They weren't out, we didn't make them special. They were crappy old canvas. They were thick, kind of dungaree style. No stretch, no stretch in these pants. You put them on, that's it. <laughs> Three times those things split on me. One time, Katie's been shot. I could bend over to scoop her up and take her into the rib. <laughs> Another time, we're out in the desert shooting and shooting, and I sit on a rock. Rip. <laughs> and one time, no reason, just standing there. Rip. <laughs> you guys have been. Nathan is going to sign. If you want to check that out, it's booth 2316. 